Hello and welcome to The Briefing Room. I'm Bill Fralick from WTCM Radio News. It's our weekly roundup of some of the stories that are making headlines across northern Michigan this week. And joining me at the table is Marissa McKay from 9 and 10 News. Welcome back, Marissa. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for being with us. Man, we've had a crazy busy week in Traverse City. Uh, yes. And as we sit down on this Thursday morning, the biggest story uh, of the week, uh, no doubt, is the shooting incident in uh, Traverse City on Tuesday night. Give us, uh, I guess let's start with the nuts and bolts. I mean, you and yeah. I both know them, but share with us uh, what happened on Tuesday night. Well, the details are limited right now, which I think from a perspective is a little frustrating. You know, we're trying yeah. to trying to get the story out there, trying to let people know what happened. It's not every day there's a fatal shooting in Traverse City. So, uh, like I said, they're limited just because police have not yet questioned Bobby Caldwell, who uh, was found holding a gun uh, in the same room that his girlfriend, Monica Anderson's body, was found in. So they're calling it first an accidental shooting and now I believe it's just a shooting investigation. Um, her children were in the home when this happened so obviously a little traumatic. Uh, I think people are trying to be a little sensitive the way that they're handling the story just because sure. there are some kids involved. Um, and we talked to some neighbors yesterday. Everybody said that she was a very sweet woman, very nice lady, uh, loved to bake, loved to play with her kids. She was a great mom and uh, her and Bobby were just like any other couple. They, they had arguments, they fought. But I don't think um, really anybody, especially these neighbors we talked to, thought it would ever end in, in such a way as right. it did. So there was a, a shooting Tuesday night. The uh, sound of a gunshot brought uh, a 911 call. Correct. We and believe from Bobby Caldwell, right? Right. Uh, who said that uh, he was attempting suicide and missed, right. basically. Uh, and then officers arrived, and at some point another shot was fired. He sh shot himself in the hand. Right. Police told us that he had actually tried to run out the back door when they arrived and that's when a gun went off and um, he accidentally shot himself in the hand. So uh, again at this point um, as you said details are limited. Let's just take a minute to talk about that frustration for, right. for, for us and maybe we care more than the <laughs> average person you know reading right. or watching but it was hard to get any news uh, between Tuesday night and Wednesday it afternoon. It was. It was. Tuesday night, uh, the law enforcement that was on the scene, we had a crew there at night, as did some of the other news stations in the area, and uh, they were very cooperative, gave a lot of information, and then the following morning we thought that it was going to be the same thing. We would probably get a little bit more detail. They, We would have assumed that they probably would have questioned Mr. Caldwell at this point, um, maybe talked to her children a little bit, but um, we didn't hear anything. The only thing that we got was a press release that actually had less detail in it than what was told to us in person the night before. Yeah. So yeah, it was definitely frustrating. You know, we're just trying to tell a story and tell people what happened. It's it's a rare occasion, I would say, in Traverse City, just for my six months here. So um, I do think that there's a, a duty then by law enforcement to be sharing as many details as they can because people are, are worried. It was it was hard to, to cover as a as a reporter. We, I mean, we have our uh, and we've mentioned on this show before. We have a daily media briefing with right. the local police where we go every morning and just right. say what happened overnight, what's the latest. Just I mean, it's an opportunity for them to talk to us and vice right. versa. Uh, and we showed up and literally nothing. I mean, there mm -hmm. was no officer that that came to the briefing um, yesterday. Right. Uh, so that was hard. Um, and so, you know, I went over to the, to the scene. The officer on the scene couldn't talk to us. He wasn't, right. you know, I'm, I'm not authorized to right. comment, so go back and talk to so-and-so. -so. And then it was a case which you experienced, I think, uh, mm -hmm. as well, where, oh, I'm not really going to talk. We have no new information. Right. How, uh, how much of a dent does that put in your day? I mean, we're talking initially 9 o'clock, then it was mm -hmm. 10, 10.30. Two, three. I mean, we were three o'clock, almost four o'clock before you know I finally got a hold of somebody. How much right. does that slow you down? It was. It, it is difficult, especially. Um, you know, we we do have other stories that we pursue throughout the day. Also, it's not. I mean, this was definitely kind of took the cake in terms of where all of my priorities were yesterday. But we were also trying to get some reaction from some neighbors as well. Which, um, you know, whenever you throw a camera in someone's face or. It, it takes a little bit yeah. of coercing sometimes and convincing before somebody's really going to agree to that, especially in situations like this, because there's a human element to this story. It's not just a news story. Someone has lost their life, and now there are two children who are very much affected by this. And so I think that it, it was difficult from both sides, from trying to tell her Monica Anderson's story and, and remind people that this, there is a human element to the story, but also yeah. the police angle was, was very difficult because I was trying to pursue talking to her neighbors, but I didn't have any information to tell them because they assumed that I would have known, known something. something. Yeah, so I didn't really have any information to share with them to help plead my case a little bit that 
I, I am trying to tell a story here. So yeah. um, it, it just slowed us down a lot. I don't think that we, um, we didn't start sort of our production work until about 3.45. Um, with a deadline at five and at six, so it does put us back a little bit. And I think the quality of your work, you you can always do better if you have more time. Yeah. So it's hard too because you know there's that maybe the, the perception by you know five o'clock in the afternoon that the whole story should be out there, and mm -hmm. especially from our perspective, you think right something that happened at ten o'clock the night before, we should have a pretty good handle on the story by five o'clock. Right. And even this Thursday morning now, it's still, we, I don't think we still have a good handle on what happened. No, we don't. I'll, I'll, the last I heard from police was that Bobby Caldwell was still in the hospital being treated for his gunshot wound. They had not yet questioned him, and no charges have been filed. So at this point, you have a 28-year-old woman dead, and no, no, no one has had to kind of take ownership of that yet or had to right. qu respond to any questioning about that yet. So I, I think it'll be interesting to see what this morning brings. That's, you know, the next question is where do we go from here today? Mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, they hope to, to talk with him. I was told they had an, a, a guard at the hospital, mm -hmm. obviously keeping uh, a right. watch, on, right. watch on him. So we presume, I mean, he's still under police protection, mm -hmm. police custody, essentially. He's not necessarily going anywhere, mm -hmm. um, but there's still lots of unanswered questions right. in this one. Uh, we could probably talk a whole half hour about this story. <laughs> There's a lot going on. Um, another story yesterday, which we probably maybe on a normal week wouldn't mention, but just because of the nature of how much it adds to your day, mm -hmm. the, the fatal accident in, in Blair Township. I right. know when we left uh, police briefing yesterday, you and your cameraman Jeremy were heading down to that area to try right. to, to get video. So. Tell us about you know juggling all that stuff all at once. Yeah, it's, it definitely takes a little bit of planning and, and kind of prioritizing your day and a lot of communication between myself and my cameraman actually got called to do some other work yesterday in the morning. So um, it was me with my with my gear driving down there. That wasn't okay. Yes, and um, I you know I'm definitely capable of doing yeah. that, but it's it's a little bit more planning and because you're you're driving, you're trying to communicate. Maybe you need to send an email, so there's a lot of pulling over and trying to deal with that. Um, and then when you get to the scene, it was all blocked off. So I had to park the car, get out, talk to an officer, make sure it was okay that I drove past the cones so that I could get close and get some footage. Um, by the time I got there, it looked like they had, um, the, a door was off one of the vehicles. So it looked to me as if they had, had to remove that door so that they could take the person out. Mm -hmm. I don't know who was in which car. Um, but yeah, and, and then even so, at that time, I didn't have any information. All I knew that is that there was a car accident um, and it happened at that road at that time and so going from there we didn't find out that it was a fatal accident until several hours after the fact right. which makes yeah. it difficult in terms of shooting video because you don't really know what story you're supposed to tell yet because you don't have any information so I think that when information is slow coming it makes your day a little bit more difficult in terms of what you're supposed to be looking for right and it's always you know when we come up to an accident scene obviously I shoot a lot less video right. on the radio now than I used right. to but uh, you're always shooting, you know, you shoot five, six, seven minutes of, of right. video and then you got to chop it down to 30 seconds. But like you right. said, it's, you, you're always shooting more than you need because you don't know what you're going to end up with by right. five o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Simultaneously, you're also thinking in your mind, what do I have to do next for this shooting right. incident? How am I going to get in touch with this woman's family members or people who are, are wanting to tell her story. And finally, at the end of the day, we were we heard from some friends who let us know about a memorial fund that has been set up for her um, at the oh. at the credit union here in town. So that's been, that was a good element to add as well, just because um, I, typically whenever we post stories on our website, you always have a few good Samaritans who see that and say, how can I help? How can I try to help this family? And so it's always good when you can let people know right. a way that they can do that. Add that to it. And you can check that out on 9and10news.com, yeah. and we've got that on our WTCM News Facebook page uh, mm -hmm. later today as well uh, if you want to help with the memorial. Uh, speaking of Facebook, mm -hmm. how important has that become either in this story or in other stories mm -hmm. to figuring out who people are and tracking down families? I right. mean, 10 years ago, this wasn't an option for us. Right, and I've only been in this industry for a, about a year and a half, so since the, all of the social okay. media has been around, so I couldn't imagine doing this job without that tool. I mean, I 
I don't even think I own a phone book, to be honest with you. If, I, if somebody told me to look them up in the phone book, I don't think we, my generation really does that. So um, when I originally found out that it was her name was Monica Anderson and, and Robert Caldwell, th that was my very first thought was, okay, let's go to Facebook and see can if her. I can find her and, and find some of her friends. And um, so I, did, I reached out that way, and I think that's how they knew that it was me covering the story, and they knew how to find me via email to let me know about right. the memorial fund. So it was crucial in finding out any pictures of, of the victim really in any situation and any story, um, if it's a good tool for that. It can also be a little difficult because there could be several people named Marissa McKay or Bill Freilich and you definitely have to make sure you got the right one. Exactly, before you're going to put that all over your news station just in terms of credibility. And you also don't want to just get your information from a social media website because that's not very credible either. So there's a, it, it's a great starting point, but it, you certainly have to follow up and do your research before you can really move forward with anything you get from there. You make an interesting point. It does seem to go both ways. It's nice that you know whoever, if, if we're reaching out to somebody that way, mm -hmm. it's nice that they can see who you are. Exactly. Um, or where you work or that you're legitimate. It's not just this phone call, Random. I'm with the TV station. Exactly, and how you know. do they know that, yeah. Right. Okay, so it makes it a little more personal. Um, and I obviously did the search yesterday too mm -hmm. and got two Monica Andersons from Leelanau County. So right. like you said, you kind of have to make sure you know who's who and, and, right. and, and what the what the connections are. But it is a great great tool Definitely. Uh, for things that, uh, that, that you don't have. Um, Let's kind of go back in time yeah. to uh, earlier this week because yes, the week still, started out. Yeah. The week started out pretty busy as well. Um, uh, Monday we had two press releases from the from the local police uh, about incidents. We had uh, the first a Detroit man who got into a fight over the weekend and mm -hmm. uh, kind of ended up in a little more trouble than than <laughs> then, he started in. Right. Uh, so tell us about that. They kind of did a, a background check on this guy, and, and right. we found out a little bit more about him. Yeah, they realized that, um, again, the Internet, a wonderful tool for the police officers and law enforcement, I'm sure. They're able to type someone's name in and see that, you know, not only do they maybe have a little bit of history with law enforcement, but they're actually breaking their, I believe it was his parole. parole yeah. Um, and so, yeah, then they were able to realize, okay, we should keep eyeing this guy. They took him to jail, and upon patting him down to go to jail, they realized that he had a, lar a large, significant amount of drugs that he was intending to distribute most likely um, and some baggies in his pocket and so um, I think had they not had that system maybe he would have been able to distribute those drugs because it was yeah. just a bar fight. Uh, interesting that uh, and obviously the prosecutor is the one who determines the charges mm -hmm. the police just kind of request the charges but um, facing a potential charge for smuggling drugs into the jail right. when by the accounts I've heard so far, it doesn't really seem like his intention. It's not like right. he was trying to get arrested yeah. and smuggle cocaine right. into jail. But by the virtue of the fact that they found several baggies of crack cocaine on him, right. allegedly, um, <laughs> that kind of changes the dynamic yeah. of it too. So they, they, you know, police told us they didn't know if he just didn't have a chance to dump it before he got arrested or... And it's not like you're going to say, hey, by the way, I have all of this in my pocket, right. so let's get rid of it before you take me to jail. So. Another big story on, on Monday this week, we had a, a situation that was avoided that could have been pretty traumatic, a pretty dangerous situation avoided in Traverse mm -hmm. City on Monday. I'll let you take it over from there. Tell us what happened out at uh, Bay Hill Apartments. Yeah, we were told uh, by police that morning that a gentleman had uh, called 911 saying that he did not want to, to live anymore, that he was um, very upset and, and very depressed, and so he turned on all the stove gas burners in his home um, with the intention that it, it could blow up, and, and this is all what he had told police who arrived on the scene. Yep. Um, we found out later from the police report that he, in fact, went to Munson Medical Center for a psychiatric evaluation by his own accord earlier that day, and um, they sent him sent him home because they do a thorough process, and they determined that he was not a threat um, to himself or to others. And unfortunately, I think that with, with mental illness, you always kind of run that risk if you're not going to, to detain someone that there is a possibility they could go home and act on, on some thoughts that they had they yeah. want to act on. Um, and so there were some other people in that apartment building, 15 to 25 is what the landlord told us could have, could have been affected. Um, the, the landlord, it was very cooperative management allowed us to, to talk to some residents, so we were able to learn that some people did smell some gas and some neighbors had actually called 911 also. Um, and so f the firefighters arrived on scene and originally we had heard that they evacuated the building, uh, but that was not the case. They actually have this electronic device that can measure the amount of gas in the air and they realized 
the department said that out in the hallway it wasn't significant enough to warrant a full building evacuation. Okay. So that was nice for those neighbors. It, it wasn't as scary, I think, as maybe it, it could have been. Well, it really, it really credits the the individual who right. called nine one one as opposed to just Letting waiting to see what happens. Right, um, exactly. Could have been pretty tragic. Right. I guess I want to ask you too because there are so many different ways that a, a landlord, an apartment building uh, business can handle dealing with the media. Yes. <laughs> that make our jobs either really a lot easier or really a lot tougher. Right. Um, and. Obviously, everyone's got their own interests, their own business interests and personal interests, so I never assume that it's going to be easy for us. Right. Uh, and I never assume that anybody's going to want to just make our day and let us come on the property and talk right. to people. But tell me how important that is, and especially uh, knowing what I remember about the, the driveway of Bay Hill, mm -hmm. it's right off of Veterans, mm -hmm. right? Um, how important that cooperation is to just being able to tell a story, because what would have happened had the, had they said no? Yeah, had they had they said no, um, we would have had to leave the property and go down to the road to the other side of the road because we couldn't be on their property at all. And because it's up such a hill, the apartment complexes, we wouldn't have been able to tell the story because we wouldn't have been allowed on the premises to show video of the building, right. to show video of um, where the, where this all took place. And so our video would have just been the sign of Bay Hill Apartments, uh, the fire truck. Maybe the fire department would have been a little bit more cooperative yeah. and let us film their their device. But that that would have been it. I, I don't and I don't know how else we would have been able to yeah. talk to some neighbors or anybody who who was around. It's always it's always tricky because you know obviously when police and fire are on scene, mm -hmm. um, they kind of I, I don't know what the official mm -hmm. <laughs> categorization is of it if that's a word. Um, they always run the scene. They're they're in charge. Mm -hmm. So when we pull up to the scene. Police and fire say, yes, you can be here, and no, you can't. Right, and you have to be a certain... A certain be, distance yes, away. Yes, exactly. But then, you know, when you're talking about the next day, the next morning, the, the dynamic changes a little bit mm -hmm. when the situation is over. Right. Um, the other interesting mix about an apartment complex is, you know, if someone says, yeah, I'll talk to you about my neighbor down the road, if they've invited you into their property or their apartment, mm -hmm. there's some degree of understanding that they... They have use of their apartment. They've invited you in as a guest, so right. you're allowed to be there too. Right. Uh, and I remember a situation. Um, I think it was a drug bust up on Lafreniere at an apartment building up there, mm -hmm. where the exact same thing happened. And in this case, um, the management didn't want us there, um, but then the tenants said, "Yeah, come on in. I'll talk to you." Mm -hmm. So it was just a hard. It, it's a hard it balancing act. So yeah, we right. got off the sidewalk. We got out of the parking lot. But we went and talked to the neighbor because they said, we'll talk to you. Right. Um, and you always have to be a little bit careful, too, because then, the, you know, these people, they, they're still neighbors at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. in, in this situation particularly, that was not the case. The gentleman, um, management, told us they were working on a 24-hour eviction just because of the, the danger that he posed to some of their other tenants. Um, okay. so, so that wouldn't have been the case. But other times you do run into, well, I don't want to talk to you because this person either had, had drugs or had a weapon or was a threat right. in some way, and I don't want to go on camera because now I'm scared. And so you have, yeah. which is definitely understandable. And, and so oh, I absolutely. think that there's a, a bit of empathy that you have to have as a reporter sometimes to try not to get as frustrated and, you know, right. they're not out to ruin your story or ruin your day. It's, it's a personal choice at the end of the day. Right. And the flip side of that is we, and I assume I speak for you, <laughs> we're not out to ruin anybody's day either. Exactly. We're not out to ruin a business. We're not out right. to give... Uh, XYZ apartment complex a bad name right and in, in stories like this and even in the in the drug bust I covered it was a, a crisis that was averted I mean exactly. we had a near it was a near explosion I think if I'm remembering right mm -hmm. five six years ago mm -hmm. um, up up on on that uh, that hill as well we're not out to to say this is a terrible place to live exactly. don't come here it's one person who right. can kind of give that reputation and in this case management understood that you know right. that they had done nothing wrong they they were just managing their apartment complex and they never had yeah. an issue with this person to the point where they felt they needed to be aware or be cognizant of his activities. And so they understood that, we understood that, and the only time the apartment's name is ever going to be mentioned in a story like this is to give people a location of where it happened. Right. And then you're just talking to you're police not constantly and neighbors. Saying, exactly. You know, yeah. Um, and it's 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 nice to just be able to to have a, a 
place that understands that. I mean, the other half of the story is mm -hmm. firefighters saved the day. Right. Firefighters went in there, figured out the threat, shut off the gas, avoided right. the explosion. Which they said could have been a small bomb, which could have been very yeah. disastrous, like you had said. So there's, like I said, we're not out to, to make it tough for anybody mm -hmm. necessarily, but we're just trying to to get the story told, so there's a challenge in that. Definitely. All right, just a, a few more minutes left here uh, on the briefing room this week. I want to talk about uh, November ratings periods, as we yes. call them, sweeps, <laughs> sweeps periods and sweeps pieces, uh, your stories that have aired uh, all throughout the month. I mean, I know 9 and 10 does a pretty good job of dozens of stories throughout right. the month, so there's always something going on that's kind of a special project. Mm -hmm. Yours just aired yesterday. Tell mm -hmm. us about that. Yeah, I was able to talk to uh, TCAPs as well as some families involved in this new online academy uh, that they rolled out this September and they said it was sort of in response to some of their homeschooled families in the area saying you know we I think especially the woman that we talked to had said I'm not a teacher by trade so I'm able to maybe teach some of the basics at an elementary level but her oldest daughter's 15 there's a lot at stake at that age there's colleges mm -hmm. and, and ACT scores and all these things that I don't think I could prep my children for so they said you know, okay, we'll, we'll come back with a program where you can r enroll your students full time in TCAPs in, in our public schools, and then you can go home and go to school on a computer, and you can have live tutors, and you can Skype with people, and um, it's, it's not necessarily TCAPs teachers who are doing that, but it's a company that they are working with, so they've approved all, all of these people. So in addition to having that option, you also have uh, administrative support. You're required to meet with the principal of whatever school you would normally be going to, and some counselors. So okay. it's definitely a lot more, I think, supports than maybe a, a, what you think of a, a traditional homeschool setting. Um. Or, or, or online, online learning, school. yeah. Um, did you talk to TCAPs? Did you were there yeah. parents you talked to that were like, "This is nuts! You have to be in the classroom to learn anything." Right. Well, we actually talked. To, we talked to TCAPs. We talked to Dr. Jane Moore, the associate superintendent, who right. sort of gave us that background as, as to why they came out with this program. And we talked to a family who um, their the parents are actually missionaries in Northeast Asia, and and they want to take their children with them. And with an, a trip coming up on the calendar, they kind of thought, and the kids had gone previously as well to an international school. Um, but they thought, you know, we really like Traverse City Public Schools. Is is there really a way that we can enroll them and have them miss a bunch of, of classes? And TCAP said, well, no, but we have this new online academy. So now the kids, um, they do go to school at home, even though they are currently at, at their home in Kingsley. But when they go to Asia for this upcoming missionary trip, they will still be on the same curriculum that your kids are in at TCAPs. Um, and then just to tell a balanced story, we did speak to a math teacher who uh, has done some online learning, some partial online classes with her students and sort of gave us the cons to maybe that situation. Um, she brought up maybe you're not a very self-motivated kid. If you're not in class with a teacher standing over you, are you really going to get your work done? I don't know. So, that, would have, that would have always been tough for me. Exactly. And yep. I think that even in college, you kind of experience that a little oh, bit yeah. too. And I think that the reason you go to college when you're 18, 19, 20 is because when you're younger, you maybe need a little bit more encouragement so that you can kind of build those good habits. And so we talked a lot about that. And, and I think that when all was said and done, it is a great program. But I do think that if you're going to take your children out of a classroom, then you need to make sure that they are still getting some social interaction. You can still be enrolled on a sports team at TCAPS through this program. So maybe your child could still do that or maybe... Um, you can involve them in some other activities and yeah. still kind of give them that experience they're not getting. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, a busy, that, that story's on the website too, I yep. take it, 910news.com. Yep. Uh, a busy month. Any other sweeps pieces that jump out in, in your mind that you've liked seeing? I mean, yeah. there's always a lot going on. I know we talked the other day right. about something that... Um, Vanessa uh, phase is done. Yeah, we, we definitely have, I mean, even our anchors who typically are not the ones out in the field with the camera getting stuff, it's really cool for them because they're they're able to do that. So Adam Bartlemay had a really interesting piece um, just about the rise of heroin in the region um, and, and he did a very great job kind of detailing how police are trying to deal with that problem. Jessica Dupnak is uh, airing something today, I believe, about uh, how to get the right kind of sleep. The I think it was some, something about oh, catching the, the right Z's. Yeah. For that, yep. And she actually went to a sleep clinic and I got, got her all hooked up. Yeah. And, yep. and so it's, it's really cool. It gives us, it's definitely something we're, we're not working on it in 10 hours. We're spending days and weeks on this so that you can really tell a more involved story. So uh, a lot of really cool things on the website. It's, I, I know, you know, you mentioned the, the sleep study. I mean, that's obviously something you can't do as a reporter in an afternoon, exactly. especially if you're going to be hooked up to all those devices. Right. And I saw the alarm clock in the video. It was like 4.30 in the morning or something. Right. So you know that there's been not just hours of shooting video involved in that, 
but then you know beyond that it definitely takes you more than a day or two to right. put all that together on top of the other job that you've got which is your daily exactly. reporting or anchoring assignments right. so that takes a lot of work um, well I want to thank you for coming in I mm -hmm. uh, appreciate Marissa McKay from 9 and 10 news joining us this week on the briefing room and I'm Bill Fralick hope you'll tune in again next time and we'll talk more about all the stories making headlines across northern Michigan have a good day